In the central part of the Republic of Macedonia, there's an area known as the Ovce Pole, the Sheep Plain. It's here, not far from a town called Sveti Nikolae, that there rises a plateau some 400 meters above sea level. Many believe now that crowning this hill are the ruins of Bilizora. Bilizora is the legendary fortress city of the Paeonians, and the Paeonians are the people who inhabited ancient Macedonia before the Macedonians arrived there. In 2008, the Texas Foundation for Archaeological and Historical Research was invited by the People's Museum of Sveti Nikolae to bring its international field school to Bilizora. The idea was to begin a cooperative effort to excavate the ruins of Bilizora. The Texas Foundation opened a number of trenches on the highest part of the plateau, which we presume to be the Acropolis of the ancient city. The TFAHR International Field School excavated there in the summers of 2008 and 2009. The finds there surpassed all our expectations. We uncovered a large defensive wall, the defensive wall of the Acropolis, a stone paved ramp, which we now presume to be part of a propylon or a monumental gate to the Acropolis. There were terraced buildings flanking the propylon, and we uncovered abundance of pottery known as Paeonian grayware. Things like small bowls, largest jars, parts of amphorae, and even large pithoi, or storage vessels. There was a great deal also of imported attic pottery, some with figures on it, most of it black glaze, and we uncovered a number of very large drinking vessels, which apparently were made in Paeonia, but imitating shapes from southern Greece. We also found fragments of an architrave from a classical style temple. In this particular instance, it's a fragment of a triglyph and metope. The finds from the two seasons were numerous and interesting. The results can be seen in our publications of 2008 and 2009 online, or you can go to our website in the section called the TFAHR Bilizora Project. Now, for those of you who received our weekly email updates during the course of the two seasons excavations, you might remember having seen this particular photograph in one of the 2009 updates. This is Rose from Australia holding what we thought was a simple iron hook, and which was uncovered in square L15. Even at the time, we thought, how odd and how seemingly useless. Not Rose, but the hook. But given all the finds of that season, we dutifully cataloged it, photographed it, packed it away, stored it, and really thought no more of it. But another of students on the Bilizora dig that summer, Pablo, from Spain. He's on the left, seen here talking to Eula. Pablo went to another excavation after Bilizora that summer. While visiting the site of Pestum, best noted for its ancient Greek temples and its excellent museum, Pablo saw something in one of the museum display cases that caught his eye. It was a set of iron objects that looked remarkably like our so-called hook from Bilizora. But the Italian excavators labeled these iron objects as keys, in fact, votive keys found in the sanctuaries in the Pestum area. Pablo did further research into the matter and came to the conclusion that the Bilizora piece might also have been a votive key. His arguments are laid out in his article online in the TFAHR Bilizora project. But one thing caught our attention with this key. It seems that the general consensus of scholarly opinion is that before this hooked or bent key evolved into strictly a votive object, it was actually a functioning key. Pablo sent us some drawings of how various scholars in the 19th and 20th centuries thought the key and lock mechanism might have worked. But the more we looked at these drawings and the more we showed them to more people, it became clear to everyone the lock and key could not have worked in this fashion. So what we decided to do was to recreate the Bilizora bent key and devise a locking mechanism which might have worked. We jettisoned the academic drawings and went back to the original sources. And of the original sources, there are three varieties. One, the vase paintings, two, literary descriptions, and three, of course, the key itself. The vase paintings gave us minimal help. They show what the outside of a door might have looked like. They indicated that the keyhole was high up on the door and that some sort of turning motion was involved. 
The woman's hand in this particular painting blocks any helpful view of the key itself. But as far as the TFAHR research went, no depictions of the lock mechanism itself for the bent key was found. The literary sources are more helpful. From Homer's Odyssey, Book 21, comes a description of Penelope opening a locked door to fetch the bow of Odysseus. The passage reads, First she set the thong free of the hook, then she inserted the key straight in and knocked back the bolt. From other passages we find out, number one, the key was a bent key, number two, the key had an ivory handle, and number three, a thong passed from the inside to the outside of the door, and outside it was fastened to a hook after the door was locked. At first we played with the idea of how a hooked key might turn and what kind of bolt it might turn against, and we came up with this scenario. We're looking now at the inside of the gate. You see the bolt firmly held by the brackets is locking the doors. The very end of the hooked or bent key protrudes through the keyhole. Naturally now when you turn the key it's going to turn in a circular motion. So let's take advantage of this circular motion. Suppose now we carve out a quarter of a circle within the bolt itself. When the key comes through the keyhole, it will turn freely and encounter no resistance when it goes through the quarter circle that's carved out. But when the key hits that point where there is no longer a carved out section, it will now begin to push the bolt back and thus freeing one of the leaves of the door. To make sure that it might actually work in this fashion, not just on paper but in reality, we asked Jordan to create an animation along these lines. So basically we took a drawing that we had as a reference and with a key that was found at the dig site and we were able to take the key out of the photograph and then make a 3D rendering of the key so that we could use it in a model to show exactly what was possible given the dimensions of the key. The beauty of an animation is that unlike drawings, which can force objects and motions into unnatural positions and movements, the animation will not let you distort the objects or motions against what you have created. In other words, once the key has been created, and once the door built and the keyhole positioned, and once the bolt put into place, you cannot, in the animation, bend the key or falsify the turning motion or reposition the bolt or make it move in an unnatural way. This, of course, will save us an infinite amount of manual labor that building an actual door and lock would entail, only to have it potentially fail. So once Jordan got a suitable animation of the unlocking, or at least one that was feasible, it was time to get to the actual recreation. The first task was to find a smith who could recreate the iron key. Working from a one-to-one -one scale drawing of the Bilizora key, our smith worked a piece of iron into the proper shape. This involved heating the piece of iron up, then bending it, reheating it, bending it again, until it finally assumed the shape of the Bilizora key. A handle was eventually devised and added, not an ivory one like Penelope's, however. The next task was to build a door. We decided to build a scaled-down miniature door to save cost and labor, since the only thing we were really wanted to look at was the key and the locking mechanism. So, a miniature door was built. The leaves were hinged to the uprights, brackets were made to hold the bolt, a keyhole was drilled, a board was designated for the bolt, and it was decided to use a one-quarter circle cutaway for the key to push against. Here we had to go back to the animation to figure out the optimal placing of the brackets for the bolt that would allow for the smooth opening of the door. So, I would say, what, this is probably full closed. This is going to be the vertical. Mm -hmm. So let's do... After a few attempts at knocking back the bolt, as Homer describes it, it became obvious the reason for the thong. The thong must be attached to the bolt, and its purpose must be to draw the bolt back into a locked position after leaving the room or house. 
This is as Homer describes the operation in Book One of the Odyssey. It says, Then she left the room and pulled the door behind her with a silver hook, which of course would be our key, and with a thong drew home the bolt. If the thong is attached to the bolt by a nail or peg, then that nail or peg could also serve to stop the bolt from being knocked back through all the brackets. That's the problem we had in the last demonstration. The hole for the thong to pass through the door must be on the same side as the bolt. Otherwise, the thong would impede entrance into the room even after the door is opened, and it would be virtually impossible to thread the thong back through the door when trying to leave. So the operation is very simple then. Once you've closed the door behind you, the one thing you have left to do is draw the bolt back into the locked position. To do that, of course, the rope is still dangling through the hole onto the other side. You just give it a good hard pull, and that will bring the bolt back into position. So with this in mind now, we go back to our door. We drill a hole for the rope to pass through. We attach it to the bolt by a nail. It will also preclude the bolt sliding back through all the brackets. And we make a few trial runs at opening and closing the gate. We talked about undoing the bolt out of the thong. back the bolt and the gate opens. Okay. Now so we're going to tie the thong on this side. We stick the hook in and turn it and the door opens. Okay, then to close it, we close the gate, and then we pull on the thong like that. And then retie the thong on this side. Voila! So what conclusions can we draw from our various trials and mistrials with the hooked key operation? Yeah. The first point is that we are not proposing that our solution is the only conceivable solution to this problem. You may have noticed in the different drawings and animations and in our model that there were slight variations in each one. We all came to the conclusion that there are probably about seven or eight different ways yeah, this something. whole mechanism could have worked. Of one thing we are very sure, and that is that this type of locking mechanism could never have been very secure. It was probably devised only to keep things like goats and chickens and children in or out of a building. Because essentially anyone with a hook of no particular crucial shape could have unlocked this bolt. And in fact, a few times we even used our finger just sticking it through the hole to move the bolt back and forth. It was probably because of this very insecurity that this type of locking mechanism did not last very long and eventually gave rise to the development of the rotation key. Here you see a rotation key in one of the TFAHR excavations at Vodarsky Rid. And of course the rotation key is the direct ancestor of the type of key that eventually came to be used with the tumbler lock.